Good morning, everyone. I'm going to welcome you to our first session. Um, topic of our first session is cybersecurity and health data. We've got three great speakers. Our first one is Gautam Kamath, who's assistant professor at the Sheridan School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. He's also a faculty member at the Vector Institute and the Canadian CIFAR AR AI chair as part of the Pan-Canadian AI strategy. Pan-Canadian, okay, okay. His research is on data privacy in machine learning and statistics. And I have my understanding is we're going to, the three speakers will speak, you get 20 minutes. I will watch your time. So I will poke you if I see it going on too long. And then my understanding is you wanna hold questions until the end. So th then we'll have a discussion with all three speakers at the end. Okay. I'll just... Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for everyone for coming here. I think this is really exciting to have the opportunity to get uh, academics, policymakers, all these people in the same room to have these very important conversations. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about a technique technology known as uh, differential privacy. Uh, I'm not going to get super technical, this is just sort of to get the ball rolling and I'm happy to take more technical questions in offline conversations. Um, so to start, I want to motivate things. Uh, nowadays, I'm sure everyone knows that modern large-scale machine learning and statistics employ enormous amounts of data, and especially sensitive data. Uh, many organizations such as Google, Apple, the US Census Bureau, uh, and many others, all touch on data which is sensitive and has to do with individual uh, individuals' data. And I want to give you a few examples to show that it's really actually easy to violate individual privacy in a number of different contexts, which uh, in any of these sensitive applications, we would want to really avoid. So one example I'll point to is a uh, vulnerability of uh, genome-wide association studies. I'm sure people in this room who work uh, with health data know much more about this application than I do, but GWAS studies are, uh, are studies in which you examine the health data or uh, DNA of thousands of individuals and try to find correlations between various genetic markers uh, and uh, diseases. Uh, and what's reported is, say, chi-squared statistics and associated p-values with them. So here's an illustration I found which uh, shows correlations between various genetic uh, locations and various diseases. So these are of course very, very important to understand the genetic origins uh, and who, which populations are more susceptible to various diseases. Uh, the challenge here is this data is naturally very sensitive. It has to do with people's medical history, their DNA, very, very sensitive, and you don't want to leak information uh, unnecessarily. In particular, even participating in such a study is a sensitive topic. For example, if there's a study involving people who are positive for HIV, then if somebody finds out that you participate in such a study, it would uh, leak your, uh, your HIV status, which could be uh, sensitive. The bad news is a, a, a very important uh, research finding by Homer et al. from 2008 found that it actually was in certain cases possible to identify who participated in GWAS studies. And uh, this is known as a membership inference attack in the sense that you can infer someone's membership in the data set used for this uh, study. And this was taken very seriously in this in particular, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, they decided this was a big enough threat that they would no longer make public certain statistics that they previously made public. And after this incident, if uh, you wanted to uh, get access to these statistics, you needed to go through a lengthy uh, approval process, which of course slows down the rate of science. So that's just one medical application that I'll mention. Another thing is uh, census data. So the US uh, every 10 years has a decennial census uh, and they decided to test how private is their census and could they leak information. So uh, using publicly released uh, statistics, the result of essentially the 2010 census, they tried to attack their own census and reconstruct some microdata. That is, given the public releases, they constructed a set of rows consisting of people's microdata, which is voting block, age, sex, race, and ethnicity. And uh, they found that they were able to do an exact match from the release statistics on almost 50% of the US population. Uh, these uh, findings were uh, you know, released publicly and uh, reported uh, unconventionally, perhaps, on Twitter. Uh, this is John A. Baud, who used to be the chief scientist of the U.S. Census Bureau. And uh, I highlighted here in particular that they were able to reconstruct essentially 46% of the population exactly. And this is very problematic because for pretty much half the U.S. population, 
this uh, microdata that I identified is enough to uniquely identify them. And uh, in particular, that allows you to match it with some external databases, reveal it, and if you match it with someone's name, then you can find out uh, information such as their age, sex, race, and ethnicity, which is uh, personally identifying information and considered sensitive. And maybe some might be thinking, okay, this is kind of a bad thing, but so what? This, this is very important because of the fact that actually this is enshrined in uh, US law. This is uh, Title 13 of the US Code, Section 9. Specifically, uh, it might be a bit hard to read, but it says uh, it's against the law to make any publication whereby the data furnished by any particular establishment or individual under this title can be identified. So they showed that you can re-identify individuals and it's illegal to release data uh, that allows people to re-identify individuals. So clearly, uh, their 2010 census release has issues. And you might be thinking, hmm, okay, there's, there's some simple solutions to this type of thing. Like there's a lot of uh, approaches that various organizations use for uh, sensitive data. For example, redacting small counts, maybe doing some rounding. I know in the Canadian census, they, for example, uh, redact small counts and round, uh, round various numbers to the nearest multiple of five or randomly round at least. Um, other things that they did in the 2010 US census were swapping individuals, for example, uh, you maybe take two individuals in the data set and just pretend they're in the other place uh, to sort of add a little bit of noise in an informal way. Um, there's other technologies, uh, privacy enhancing technologies known as K-anonymity. Um, based on some conversations yesterday, I added here actually synthetic data, uh, which is another kind of approach that some people use. But one thing I want to say is that all of these are heuristic or best effort privacy methods. And every single one of these have been shown to be vulnerable to privacy risks in a number uh, privacy tax in a number of different uh, settings. And this is really bad news when you're mandated A, by law to protect privacy, or B, you want to ensure, I, I think a word that's come up a lot in the last couple of days is trust. And if you lose trust, it's impossible to get it back. So again, the, the thing I want to highlight here is all of these are heuristic or best effort uh, approaches. And I want to show you something in particular that's more rigorous and uh, gives provable guarantees in terms of privacy. And this is the notion of differential privacy introduced in 2006 by Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and Smith. So I'm gonna try to give you uh, a little bit of an illustration or a caricature of uh, how differential privacy works or what it's trying to protect against. Um, we're not gonna get into formal definitions today really because uh, I'm happy to talk about it offline, but we wanna keep this a bit less technical. So the type of setting which differential privacy operates in, we imagine there's some data set which is sensitive in nature it's fed into a statistic or sometimes called an algorithm, depending on who you're talking to, and that produces an output. Now you imagine alternatively, maybe a different data set, which has one change in it, was fed into the statistic and that produces an output. Now we imagine that a malicious party is looking at the output of the statistic and is trying to figure out what was the input data set? Was it X or X prime? Like was there this one data point in it or not? And if we say, and if the malicious party is unable to identify whether it was X or X prime better than taking a random guess, then we say the statistic is differentially private. If you're confused by the malicious party, come to Waterloo. You'll see why uh, they're so malicious. So that's the intuition. Uh, and you know, there's a formal definition behind what differential privacy is. I'm just gonna flash this and don't read it. Um, this is the in informal definition of what differential privacy is. Roughly speaking, an algorithm or statistic is differentially private if it's hard to tell if one data point was added or removed solely by looking at the output of this statistic. One thing I wanna highlight, uh, which we'll return to a little bit later, is this a quantitative definition in the sense that epsilon is some number which you can tweak higher or lower depending on how private you want your uh, output to be. A smaller epsilon means it's more private, a larger epsilon means it's less private. And uh, this allows trade-offs between privacy and utility. We'll return to that in a few more slides. But let me just, this, this might be a little bit weird, like uh, this, this definition here. Why is this a reasonable notion of privacy? Uh, informally, I'll reason about it. You know, this is a proof in, uh, I'm hand-waving a bit here. But the idea is that, the first claim I made, the definition is that looking at the output, you can't tell if a user was in the data set or not. So therefore, if you can't even tell if a user was pregnant, or sorry, present, knowing everything about them, then you certainly can't know their data, for example, if they're pregnant or not, uh, amongst other things. Um, but yeah, the idea is that it prevents a number of different attacks, including things like database reconstruction, such as the census example that I gave, 
So you can't find a user's private data. It protects against membership inference, such as uh, the GWAS example I gave earlier, and much more beyond these two instances. Uh, there's, there's really, it's a very rigorous and strong notion of data privacy, which prevents a whole swath of different privacy attacks. So who uses differential privacy? There's a many organizations, for example, the three I flashed before, Google, Apple, the US Census Bureau, as well as Microsoft, LinkedIn, Facebook Meta, and really uh, a lot of different organizations beyond these. One thing that I think is notable is the fact that these are all primarily US uh, organizations. I was trying to find out if there are any Canadian organizations which currently use differential privacy. And to the best of my knowledge, maybe some folks here who work in policy or on the inside of various organizations might be able to say more, but I'm not aware of any. Um, best I can say is there's a uh, layer six, which is at, uh, associated with TD Bank. I know they're, they're a research lab and they have researchers on differential privacy, but I'm not currently aware of any organizations that uh, use differential privacy within Canada. So I think we are lagging behind in that regard. So I'm going to just talk about two slides, uh, you know, getting a slightly two or three slides, a little bit more technical to try to give you an intuition of what differential privacy is and how it works. And the basic intuition is when we're doing differential privacy, we add some noise to mask any individual contributions, but little enough noise to still be useful. And I'll use the running example of, uh, for example, you suppose you have a population and you wanna know how many of these people smoke, which may be a sensitive topic. Uh, for example, maybe you don't want your insurance to know that because they'll uh, increase your premiums if they know you're a smoker. So suppose you have a data set in which 20 people are indeed smokers and they say yes. You could imagine reporting, okay, 20 people uh, say yes, but that is not an appropriate privatization of the statistic. So I'm gonna claim instead an appropriate thing to do would report 20 plus random noise. And you know I sampled some random noise myself and you can imagine instead of 20 reporting say 19.59 or instead of 20 reporting 21.73 or something like that. So this might seem obvious, of course, like, you know, you, instead of reporting the true thing, just add some noise. Now, while it's true that this is an obvious or intuitive solution, the nice thing about differential privacy is it, it allows you to rigorously reason about how much noise to add and how private it is as an effect, uh, as well as other things. So to kind of uh, hammer this home, uh, I wanna show you this theorem about differential privacy if you took the number of smokers, you add noise sampled according to a Laplace distribution with parameter one over epsilon, this guarantees epsilon differential privacy. And this is a picture of a Laplace distribution. It's a two-side exponential if you're not familiar, but this is, this is literally as technical as the talk is gonna get. And the point, I, you know, even if this doesn't make full sense to you, I just wanna show you that there is a theoretical guarantee. It's provable, possible to prove that this disclosure is differentially private and you can understand rigorously what are the downstream effects of releasing a statistic which is differentially private. I also wanna show that this is a quantitative definition and you can tune a knob depending on how private you want things to be. So going back to this example with 20 smokers, you can guarantee uh, differential privacy with parameter epsilon equals one by adding noise from a Laplace distribution with parameter one. So some examples are say 20.68, 19.83. So you can see that this is not the exact same as 20. It only adds a little bit of noise. And it's, a, it's, it's not bad, it's pretty close to the true thing. But suppose you want stronger privacy, you can guarantee epsilon equals 0.1 differential privacy by adding Laplace 10 noise. And you can see here that you get kind of worse accuracy, but my claim is that these give better privacy. And so the, the thing I wanna hammer home with these uh, two things here is that it's quantifiable. You can add more or less noise to give better privacy, but uh, less utility or the other way around, depending on where your organization's uh, priorities lie. For example, if you need very strong uh, utility for the data to be useful at all, then maybe you'll have to sacrifice on uh, privacy. The last point I wanna mention, which is technically related, is the fact that this is a composable definition. Like, let, let me just say you could report the number of smokers and that's it. This is not very useful because typically when you're looking at a sensitive data set, there's many, many different statistics you wanna do uh, and look at. So it's also composable in nature. So to sort of give you an example, uh, suppose you had 100 people, 
20 are smokers, let's noise that. Say 37 have some chronic illness, let's noise that. And uh, 12 make a lot of money, uh, let's noise that. Now, each of these individually is a private disclosure. What if we released all three at the same time? The nice thing is that differential privacy gives you a framework in which to quantify how private it is to release all three of those at the same time. Informally speaking, just add up the parameters. Each one is one differentially private, so together they're three differentially private. And there's more complicated things you can do, but that's at least the basics. And the main thing that I want to emphasize here is that it allows you to quantify the composition of releasing multiple statistics, which you can imagine is crucial for a census where you might, uh, where you might release you know, hundreds or even thousands of statistics pertaining to a single individual, such as uh, you know, if you have, say, uh, a, wh a white male, then you might include them in statistics on the number of males in their city or at another population level, and you're going to release a lot of statistics on that one person, and you want to make sure that your overall disclosure isn't going to violate too much privacy. So that's all I want to say technically. I'm going to sort of conclude by giving you a few examples on where differential privacy has been used. One example uh, release was by Google. Uh, after COVID-19 began, uh, began worldwide in, say, March of 2020, uh, they released community mobility reports. I'm sure many of you uh, stayed home uh, as the pandemic began and didn't go to uh, work, work from home instead. And so what Google did was they looked at uh, location data and managed to quantify this. Uh, so in particular, you can see in these uh, data, this data they gave here for the Waterloo region, you can see that uh, workplaces were 22% less populated compared to the baseline, transit stations as well, parks were less, residential uh, was more. Um, and you might be wondering, how did they get this data? Well, the good and bad news is that kind of everyone is being tracked by Google if you don't opt out. Uh, you know, your phone tells them a lot of information. Naturally, this is very sensitive information uh, in the sense that I don't want, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm okay and I trust Google with my location data, uh, but I don't want this to be posted on the internet so that every single person sees where I am at every, any given time. So they realized this and they were responsible with their data disclosure by noising these statistics using differential privacy to avoid uh, leaking too much information on single individuals. Another application is one that I alluded to before. Uh, the, in the Census Bureau in the US, they determined that the 2010 census was not appropriately private in order to uh, guarantee the privacy laws that they are uh, legally held to uphold. So in the 2020 census, this is perhaps the highest profile uh, deployment of differential privacy um, for you know, 300, plus a million, 300 million plus Americans. All of their data was run through differential privacy in a method kind of similar to what I outlined, you know, just by adding noise, but with a lot more work to make sure things are uh, done well. You know, they took on the left, you can see their true data, they added noise to it appropriately, and at a very variety of different geographical levels, they make sure it's consistent. For example, it would be silly to have the state populations not add up to the national population, and so they do some bells, fancy bells and whistles on top of that. But yeah, I think it shows that the US Census Bureau, at least, realizes that differential privacy is the right way to guarantee this type of uh, individual data privacy that uh, they're required to uphold. So I'll conclude, hopefully I got across uh, here today that differential privacy is a rigorous and versatile tool for privacy preserving data analysis. Um, and I think Canadian organizations maybe need to reevaluate privacy and disclosure risk of their sensitive uh, statistical releases when pertaining to sensitive data. In particular, red teaming is a common approach where you know, one team makes some statistical releases and then uh, they're sort of stress tested uh, from a, an attacker's perspective, which is I think very important to do. Um, and I think it's time that we move beyond heuristic and best effort approaches for privacy and turn towards rigorous methods for a number of reasons that I've mentioned. One, including to employ, uh, ensure compliance with privacy legislation, which we already have a lot of great privacy legislation in Canada, but um, there's a number of privacy legislation that are being considered now in Canada around the world. For example, GDPR is a relatively new one uh, in Europe and Canada has some which are being uh, proposed right now in uh, parliament. So these are things that need to be, you know, we need to make sure our uh, privacy tools stay up to date with the regulations. 
But, and again, to use this word trust, I think it's very, very important to give Canadians trust in how their data is used, particularly in health applications. And once you lose trust, uh, then it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. All right, I'll conclude there. Thank you very much.